Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to the first installment of the SDS 2022 webinar series. This webinar series features presentations and panel discussions on a variety of topics relevant and important to cardiothoracic surgeons. The topic for this month is bronchoscopy, electromagnetic robots, and ablation. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the STS website, YouTube, YouTube channel, and as part of the Hot Topics podcast. At this time, I am pleased to welcome our moderators for this session, Dr. Haran Fernando and Dr. Douglas Minich. Moderators, welcome. I will now turn it over to you. Uh, well, th thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and thank you to the SDS uh, for sponsoring this uh, uh, webinar, which will be covering bronchoscopy. Uh, and we'll be looking at uh, techniques such as electromagnetic navigation, robotic bronchoscopy, and ablation. I think this will be an interesting evening. I'd like to welcome the speakers and my co-moderator, Dr. Minich. And uh, the first talk, we'll get right into it, will be from Dr. Janini uh, Reisenauer, who's going from the Mayo Clinic, who's going to be talking about robotic navigation with the iron and monarch systems and uh, touching some of the issues with this. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and present as a part of this talk today. I'll be discussing robotic navigation with the ion and monarch systems. Um, my name is Jenny Reisenauer, and I'm a thoracic surgeon and a board certified interventional pulmonologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, so we'll look back at 2019 when essentially two robotic bronchoscopes became available and approved by the FDA. Um, th that was the ION system, which many of you know is manufactured by Intuitive Surgical, the same company that manufactures the Da Vinci robotic systems. And then the second system, which is called Monarch, manufactured by Oris, which was recently acquired by Johnson & Johnson. There is a third system that is being developed by a company called NOAA uh, Medical, and hopefully that will be out sometime next year. The two systems are inherently different in terms of the way they function. Um, the, many of you might be familiar with electromagnetic navigation as what is used in superdimension or in the Varen spin system. And the Oris Monarch system uses electromagnetic navigation in a similar fashion. The outer diameter of the catheter is six millimeters in size with a working channel of 2.1 millimeters in size. The intuitive system is slightly different. It utilizes a technology called shape sensing robotic bronchoscopy, which I'll get into in the next slide. The outer diameter here is 3.5 millimeters in size with a working channel of two millimeters. Just a word on um, shape sensing technology. What this essentially allows you to do is use an optical fiber, which is fully embedded throughout the length of the ion articulating catheter, which essentially gives you proprioception in the X, Y, and Z plane so that the catheter essentially knows where it is at all times based on real feedback of proprioception of where it is um, in the airway. It's also usable in patients that have pacemakers and other implants, um, and there's no concern for artifact or, or metal in terms of um, distorting the signal. Um, this is a room layout of the ion bronchoscopic system. Um, it, it's a mobile system that essentially attaches to the, to the endotracheal tube of the patient magnetically through a magnetic swivel adapter. The controller, this is our bronchoscopy suite, and this is how we typically position patients. And the controller is typically here, and the star is denoted by where the physician stands. But I'll just note that the controller is mobile um, and can be put anywhere in the room so that the physician doesn't necessarily have to be standing uh, right at the control. Uh, the controller doesn't have to be standing um, right at the head of the patient. Uh, anesthesia typically moves farther away towards the feet of the patient, such that fluoroscopy or any other imaging systems can come into play. Uh, the, this is a screenshot of the Monarch uh, footprint that was published by Tim Magoo and colleagues from the University of Chicago. The layout here is very similar in that the anesthesia tower is either pushed way out to the shoulder of the patient or way out to the feet, allowing room for the C-arm to come in and the orus cart, which also docks to the patient's endotracheal tube through which the catheter is inserted. 
So in terms of differentiating features between the two systems, the ION, as I mentioned, is a shape sensing system. You do need a preoperative thin slice CT scan to register and navigate to the patient. But unlike traditional sensor, unlike traditional electromagnetic navigation, there's no sensors, there's no board, and there's no mapping of the RUM that is required. Uh, one of the criticisms of the ION system is that there is no vision at the time of the biopsy. So the proceduralist is fundamentally required to rely on the fluoroscopic uh, feedback and the radial EBUS feedback. And I'll show some video of that here in just a few minutes. This is just a picture of what the ION system looks like. This is a 4K HD camera that gives you orientation in relation to the orientation that was uh, registered um, at the time of the registration to the pre-procedural CT scan. Above, you've got a center line view, which can tell you if you've taken a wrong turn, which it did look like I took there momentarily, um, to make sure that you're following the pathway throughout the various tortuosities in the airway. And then you've got an overall airway view up at the top, which denotes the optimal fluoro angle if you're using conventional 2D fluoroscopy, as well as your various anatomic markers. Here we've marked the diaphragm and the peripheral pleura. Um, you do have vision during the entire time that you're able to biopsy. Um, and anesthesia parameters are important. So all patients are in general paralyzed uh, with high PEEP uh, and low FiO2. Um, and that allows for um, maximal visualization as well as minimal divergence from the CT scan uh, preoperatively. Once the lesion is arrived at, the standard workflow is to remove the vision and place a radial EBUS probe. This is what's going through the catheter here. This is a pericardial lesion that we're biopsying or a, or a peripericardial lesion, I should say. And once a signal is acquired, um, you can then mark that with fluoro as we've done here in a slightly different lesion. And once you've obtained your uh, fluoro mark that tells you you're in the region of the lesion of interest, the um, ultrasound catheter is withdrawn and a biopsy needle is inserted through the sheath. ION manufactures three different size needles. Um, and you can also use off-label forceps, brushes, and BAL through the system as well, um, based on whatever the clinical indications are for the patient. Um, we also use something called mobile 3D imaging. There's a number of systems that are out right now. We've acquired the Siemens. This also allows us to acquire a low-level CT scan at the time of the procedure to verify that our tool is in the lesion. This is a gigantic lesion, but I think it illustrates the point well that we have tool and lesion in all three axes. Um, so you can just be more confident about your biopsies. Um, in, this is in contrast to Monarch, which as I mentioned, does use electromagnetic navigation. The system does require a pre-op CT and patient sensors, but unlike Superdimension, there's no room mapping that is required. It functions by mechanism of a computer vision system that identifies structures and updates in real time, which maintains position even as the lung moves, enhancing the ability of the traditional electromagnetic navigation that most of us are familiar with. You also have vision assistance during your biopsy. Here's a case from uh, the Monarch system. I believe this is one of Dr. Kyle Hogarth's cases from Chicago. Um, as you can see here, you've got 3D visualization through the airway of where uh, you're driving at all time um, using that proprioception. And then you also have a 3D view of where your, your airway is and a good sense of when you're transgressing that airway um, and, and going outside the airway to access these nodules. Um, the catheter can then be oriented so that you're focused right at the center of the nodule and you do have visualization as you're obtaining your biopsy. Uh, most of us have rapid on-site cytology immediately available in the room. I think that this significantly helps guide feedback um, so that you know that you're in the right location and that you're obtaining the results that you expect to obtain. In the last couple of minutes here, I just wanna go through the data that have been published on both sides. Um, I eliminated any abstracts or any um, cat cadaveric or animal studies. And these are the major uh, publications from Monarch that you can see. Um, as you can see, ranges anywhere from 25 to 170 lesions with a variance of, of median size. Diagnostic yield in one study was tremendous at 96%, but overall the yield seems to hover about 75 to 80% with very low pneumothorax rates, much lower than some institutions for CT-guided biopsy. 
but notably a high bronchus sign or airway sign that was present. There's currently an ongoing study of which Tim Magoo is the primary investigator. They are assessing safety time of biopsy and diagnostic yields for lesions that are eight millimeters to 50 millimeters in size and 14 sites are enrolled. On the ion side, the first prospective multicenter trial was completed. You can see the six investigators on the slide. Uh, this study looked at 360 subjects across six centers in the United States, assessing sensitivity for malignancy and diagnostic yield. The results of that study is published here in the second column with a median nodule size of 17 millimeters, a 91%, or I apologize, over here in the first column with a median lesion size of 17 millimeters and a diagnostic yield of about 83%, but with a sensitivity of malig for malignancy of about 88%. These are the additional case series that have been published with a variance of just standard 2D fluoroscopy versus 3D fluoroscopy versus cone beam CT. And as you can see with both navigation systems with 2D fluoroscopy alone, we're looking at about 75 to 85% yield, but what really bumps you into the 90s is having good imaging at the time of the robotic bronchoscopy. As this technology evolves, we will see challenges with being able to go after smaller nodules, benign nodules, and being able to adequately obtain molecular markers um, in those nodules that are difficult to reach. But what we do know right now is that robotic bronchoscopy is safe with adequate reach, great visualization, minimal deflection during bronchoscopy, and is certainly compatible with other technologies. And so what we have in the future and in the present state um, is the opportunity to localize under cone beam CT and do a targeted uh, resection. We have opportunities to do uh, single stage anesthesia, bio, uh, single stage biopsy staging and resection under one anesthetic, like what's being done here. And I think one of the subsequent talks will address. And then also opportunities for ablation, chemo and immunotherapies, and, and who knows what else through this established platform, which I think will also be covered in the subsequent talks. So I think it's an exciting time. Um, I think thoracic surgeons should absolutely learn the technology, regardless of which one, to stay relevant. And I think we'll see a lot of interesting data and studies coming down the pipeline. I thank you for your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reisenauer. Uh, a great talk and great review of both of those technologies. Uh, we will uh, continue on with our next uh, panelist, uh, who is Dr. Benny Wexler from Drexel University, who will be discussing uh, dual robotic procedures. Uh, and just as a quick reminder for the participants, uh, questions can be entered into the chat section, and uh, we will organize those for discussion at the end of the talks. Uh, Dr. Wexler. Well, thank you, Dr. Minich and the STS for um organizing it and allowing us to uh, share experience. Um, I'm honored to be in such a, a distinguished uh, uh, company. Uh, Dr. Reisenhower really made my uh, work easier and I would thank her for that. These are my disclosures. I am a, a speaker proctor for uh, intuitive surgery. So dual, dual robotic procedures, I think we can look at two areas. One, as was alluded before, a robotic biopsy of a lung lesion falling by resection, the same anesthetic procedure. And I think that's attractive. It decreases time from diagnosis to treatment. It's comfortable for patients. Um, however, it is dependent on rel reliable cytopathology. And then you have the risk of false negative currently for those nodules that are less than 15 millimeters. Uh, and then what you do. Um, it has a, an, another issue of increased OR utilization. If you need to wait for a long time for rows, et cetera, et cetera, the Bronc Lab is usually less expensive. In our institution, we have not um, gone this route yet, uh, mostly um, because of uh, cytopathology that, that is um, not as reliable uh, immediately. They come to the diagnosis later, but that doesn't help for this uh, particular procedure. Um, on the other hand, not a localization and then a diagnostic therapeutic wedge and then followed by an anatomic resection, if indicated, is actually very attractive. And we have had experience with that. Uh, it gives you precise localization of nodules that are smaller than one centimeter or deep. 
allows for minimal invasive resection. It's excellent for diagnostic wedge resection, followed by anatomic lung in patients with GGO. It's really easy and fast to perform. So, you know, clinical problem here. This is a lady with uh, leiomyosarcoma of the uterus that in her preoperative uh, CT, when she was being staged for treatment, two of those tiny little nodules were found. And, and the oncologist and the GYN oncologist, you know, calls me and said, look, this is going to change significantly your treatment. Can you do something? And yes, we localized those nodules, the, actually the one in the lower lobe. And, and uh, sure enough, it was leiomyosarcoma and it changed the way she was treated. This lady with uh, previously resected synovial sarcoma had this tiny little nodule that was found several months earlier and it was two millimeters and then it went to four millimeters and then it went to 5.4 millimeter. And finally, the oncologist called. You see that this nodule is almost a centimeter from the pleura, pretty small, very hard to feel. Um, we localize it and, and unfortunately um, also synovial sarcoma. We have had experience with uh, localization of nodules, both for anatomic and, and wedge resection with the Super D uh, with a pretty good success rate. Uh, 70 out of 72 nodules well localized. I'm not going to talk too much. We elected to use the ION uh, for different uh, reasons. Um, one of them was we thought that this technology and this video was shown had um, uh, perhaps a, a little more um, modern, um, maybe. Um, and we also liked the small diameter of the catheter, uh, despite some of the disadvantages that Dr. Eisenhower pointed out. So what's the workflow? So the workflow here, you need a dedicated high-resolution non-contrast CT of the chest. You upload those images into a planning station. You download it in a jump drive and then you upload them to the bronchoscope. A little uh, cumbersome, and hopefully one day they will be able to connect our medical record to the bronchoscope and, and we don't have to do all that, um, but this is how it works right now. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna run through this video because it was shown, but basically you do a registration and you can see that as you go through each lobe, the device recognizes that you are there. And after you go through each lobe, um, you have the virtual image and the bronchoscope and you make sure that they are aligned and looks pretty good here. And after you confirm that they are aligned, you kind of follow the path. It's, it's really not that hard after you figure it out. And you can see here, we just follow the path. We see the lesion and that lesion um, will be marked. Now, an important thing for marking lesion, you have to pull the the vision probe a little bit to make sure that you're against the bronchial wall, as you can see it happening here. And again, the workflow on this navigation, you navigate to the nodule, you confirm position against bronchial wall, you confirm position by fluoroscopy, you remove the vision probe, insert, and I use a 21 French needle, they're pretty flexible. You deploy the internal sheet on the fluoroscopy, you deploy the needle on the fluoroscopy, and then I inject ICG. Now, everything is on the details, right? And uh, so those patients kept paralyzed, as Dr. Reidenhauer mentioned, tidal volume of 8 mLs per kg. I use PEEP of 10 for everybody, and it helps a lot. Um, I don't inject more than 0.7 mL of dye. Otherwise, the, the risk of the whole dye spreading is, is big. I don't inject closer than 5 millimeters to the pleura. Um, because otherwise you end up penetrating the pleura. You got to make sure the catheter is against the bronchial wall. And my experience is that you will likely be about half a centimeter closer to the target than you think, and you need to adjust accordingly. I don't use EBUS or cone bean CT for that. So those are the small precautions that I need to take. And you can see here um, that image on, on the lower arrow, you see that the device is providing you the distance to the lesion. And when you deploy the needle, then you take half a centimeter from where you want to be and deploy the needle to that distance. In this case, I would probably deploy the needle 
only half a centimeter. So what indications do we use for this localization procedure? Um, usually nodules that are smaller than 10 millimeters or they're deeper than 10 millimeters from pleural surface. Ground glass opacities that we are concerned and we wanna do a wedge followed by anatomic lung resection. Um, some, we have a couple of cases of cystic uh, lesions that we didn't think we would be able to, to, to feel. So basically if you're concerned, we marked and we are slowly increasing our numbers of marking and being more aggressive with it. So far we had 17 patients that had, um, and this is only including patients that had ion bronchoscopy followed by a robotic resection. 16 had successful localization. And by successful localization, I mean the, the dye where was where it was supposed to be, did not extravasate. We were able to fill the nodule when we remove it or the pathologist was able to localize it. Our case number three had the extravasation of contrast into the pleural cavity. And although we were able to resect the nodule minimally invasive, um, we considered this a failure. And all procedures were completed robotically. The median nodule size was nine, the distance to the pleura five, millimeters, and the medium nodule size on pathology was 10 millimeters, slightly bigger. The 23 millimeter nodule that you see was a cystic lesion um, that turned out to be amyloidosis, as a matter of fact, and um, I was concerned that I would not be able to fill it. 15 wedges and two segmentectomies, no conversions, all nodules were successfully resected. Those are the pathology, um, you know, we have oncologists and, and a large pancreatic service. So 23% were uh, pancreatic cancer followed by sarcoma. Two patients with lung cancer, those are the ones that had um, segmentectomy. And then others, including one case of atypical adenom adenomatous hyperplasia that I elected um, to just do the wedge. I didn't think we needed more than that. And there were four benign cases and those are benign cases, kind of a, a little weird group with amyloidosis, crypto, and things like that. Patients did well, one day of chest tube removal, one day of length of stay. There were no complications related to the bronchoscopy. Two patients had complications related to surgery. One required a chest tube replacement, and the other one developed severe ileus respiratory failure and remained in the hospital for a long time. However, no hospital or 90 days mortality. This procedure, and I, I know it's hard to see, but it, it takes us now between nine and 12 minutes to do, and that's all it adds to the case. So it is, it is relatively fast after you get it. And this is the result of what you get. And this is a, what, what I called an ideal marking, in, in, in my opinion. It's one small discrete area of contrast that you can see and easily um, resect. This next case is, is, is not as nice, but still localized. And we did a wedge here and the nodule was there. Um, you can see that it's a little more diffuse than the other one. And, um, but still not, not a, not a huge deal. So in conclusion, I think that, that those procedures, this procedures like doing robotic, robotic things are gonna become way more common as more people are adopting the technology and robotic bronchoscopes are gonna be more available. After conquering the learning curve, the, the, and, I, and I don't mean to take away from any of our uh, pulmonologists, um, it, it, it is a relatively easy procedure, relatively fast. And reliable. And remember, I'm talking about nodule localization, not necessarily biopsy. Those can be a little more complex. Um, a diagnostic biopsy following immediately by resection, I think, is very attractive. Um, but I think for a little bit, it will remain for a select group of patients and in selected centers. Finally, marking of nodules for surgical resection is very effective. Improved diagnostic yield and ability to perform minimally invasive resection. Well, thank you very much. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you. So uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Wexler, for that great talk. Uh, we'll do the questions at the very end. And I'd like to next introduce uh, Dr. Calvin Ng from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. 
Uh, and so good morning to you. And uh, he's going to be discussing bronchoscopic ablation. Thank you very much, uh, Krish, and I hope everyone can uh, hear me. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, give this talk and our uh, modest experience of using um, transbronchial approach to ablate uh, lung tumors. These are my disclosures. So I think when you um, look at ablation, uh, you're really looking at the local therapy, of course, and you're just trying to compare it with other forms of local therapy like SBRT or even the surgical wedge resection. Traditionally, ablation has been done through the percutaneous route that's uh, often associated with the high risk of pneumothorax, hemothorax, and bronchopleural fistula or pulmonary pleural fistula. And in some areas of the lung, it's really uh, difficult to access um, uh, because of its location uh, from a percutaneous route. And um, most of the time, uh, in fact, the energy that's been used is radio frequency uh, in the data that's available, and it produces a relatively small ablation zone and is relatively uh, uh, less predictable with uh, heat sink effect and so on. When you look at the literature, in fact, um, you see the bubble there, percutaneous ab um, ablation is associated with really a 11 to 52% uh, risk of um, you know, pneumothorax or pleural based complications, uh, which is not low. When you look at the other kind of uh, data uh, from uh, SBRT uh, is not uh, so benign. Uh, SBRT does carry a 22% risk of radiation pneumonitis and pneumonia in some of the series. Potentially one of the game changes that we have the opportunity to adopt is to do the ablation through endobronchial route. And of course that significantly, uh, just by common sense, reduces the risk of pneumothorax and uh, fistula formation. And of course, with the platforms that are increasingly available, uh, access to small nodules or difficult to reach places uh, may not be a problem anymore. The other potential area of change is really the use of energy. Um, the other type of thermal energy is the microwave energy that produces a bigger ablation zone and is often more predictable because of the nature of how it works. There are many, many studies, uh, reviews, meta-analysis comparing, for example, SBRT uh, versus ablation. Uh, this one I got from uh, Yale uh, University uh, about two years ago that was uh, a review and meta-analysis of histologically proven uh, stage one non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, they basically pulled out the data from uh, thermal ablation, mostly percutaneous versus SBRT. And as you can see, the numbers uh, of ablation is much less, it's about just over a thousand versus 27,000 for SBRT patients. And you can see in the literature, that's one of the reasons why often ablation is not much discussed in MDT meetings because, you know, the radiation oncologists would have more data to, to, to sort of present and support their cases. However, um, you know, when you look at the conclusion, overall survival in thermal ablation um, was not inferior to SBRT for uh, a primary treatment of stage one non-small cell lung carcinoma. Um, when we reach next month, uh, we would have done um, sort of bronchoscopic microablation for about three years now. So we do uh, have some upcoming sort of intermediate uh, follow-up results uh, that we're looking into right now. This is one of the first cases of a patient who's had previous lobectomy elsewhere and uh, has a uh, left uh, upper lobe uh, lung cancer that was ablated. And this is 10 minutes uh, after the ablation with the destruction of the tumor showing the ground glass change and uh, the margins that we need. Um, we recently presented our um, uh, data in a Navablate study in uh, ERS, um, and this is the first perspective uh, international study that was done with the London of really just looking at early uh, results in terms of safety and feasibility, not so much recurrence and so on. Um, when this study, we um, basically ablated uh, nodules that were less than three centimeters in size and not uh, abutting the pleura, uh, more than five millimeters from the pleura, uh, and who are not candidates, obviously, for surgery and other forms of treatment. Um, and uh, of course, everyone would need a CT scan in order to do this uh, ablation procedure to see the results. So out of the 30 nodules, 
two thirds were for primary lung and one third were for metastatic lesion. And most of them were in the periphery of the lung and uh, a third was in the mid zone of the lung. Uh, the median nodule size around 12 millimeters, but they went, did go up to 27. And the success rate for technical success was 100% uh, with a mean ablative margin of around nine millimeters uh, around the lesion. And um, the, uh, there was no observed progression uh, at the early stage, uh, which doesn't surprise uh, many people. There was one um, adverse event that was related to the ablation device, which is a mild hemoptysis that was uh, self-resolving, um, didn't need any medication, just needed observation. And there were four subjects that had uh, minor um, sort of uh, events, including uh, low-grade uh, fever, uh, pleurifusion that required drainage, uh, and sort of inflammatory response with uh, needing uh, some uh, oxygen therapy and so on. There are no deaths and actually no pneumothorax in this uh, um, uh, well sort of uh, conducted series. So as an option, this kind of treatment for malignant uh, lung nodules uh, of less than three centimeters um, could be relatively safe and has a low complication rate and high technical uh, efficacy. Outside of the Navibate study, uh, we did patients that did not reach the criteria for this, um, and we collected uh, also uh, around 30 cases um, ourselves, and um, this is the available literature uh, outside of Navibate. So this will encompass uh, patients that don't have a definitive diagnosis, uh, for example, histologically of a malignancy that were closer to the pleura, for example, than five millimeters and so on. Um, during the same sort of period of time, um, and uh, they had the moderate uh, comorbidity index, uh, obviously because they were not uh, surgical candidates um, in a lot of the cases, and uh, the lesion size was um, a little bit uh, bigger, up to two centimeters on average, and there was no blood loss, and hospital stay was about one day. Um, a number of uh, lesions uh, there required what we call double ablation. Uh, after one blast, uh, we did the comb beam CT and show the margin in some areas was uh, maybe inadequate. So we blasted again. Um, and in a number of cases, also a few cases, we did a biopsy uh, and sent it off uh, for uh, frozen prior to ablating the lesion as well. In general, the um, anesthetic time is around two hours um, for the ablation. And um, we do need a few cone beam CTs uh, during the procedure. And the margin that we got was uh, six millimeters minimal margin. These are some of the images um, that uh, to show you what goes on. This is actually a very big lesion. This is uh, two point something centimeters uh, towards the upper limit of the lesions that we would tend to ablate. And you'll see these uh, colored circles that uh, encompass two areas of ablation. So this was ablated twice with a renavigation of the um, ablation uh, catheter. And uh, with the overlay, you can see the lesion uh, was here. And this is all area of destruction um, around it uh, with a, a couple of millimeters margin uh, circumferentially. In terms of pain, um, many people worried about pain if you burn the pleura or the ribs. In fact, we only had about 15% of patients who did have any pain. Most of them had, were painless and just went home uh, really happy. Um, pneumothorax happened in two cases that required drainage um, and uh, the air leak, just one of them was not present and insertion of the drain, the other just stopped overnight. Um, and then those two patients requiring fever, requiring some observation for another day. As I said, one hemoptysis case um, that uh, was self-limiting and, inf and an infected diffusion that required drainage and a couple of days of antibiotics. The procedure time uh, seemed to be decreasing um, over uh, our case number, uh, suggesting a, uh, a you know steep learning curve. But there were cases that um, took longer um, as we were less selective in our cases in terms of navigation uh, to the lesion and size, etc. So after these uh, 60 cases, um, we've now uh, done uh, over 100 cases of ablation, and we did have one case of bronchopleural fistula. Um, this was uh, actually not uh, in the early post-op period. Um, the patient came back after uh, two weeks with some shortness of breath and infusion. And um, uh, what happened was that we ablated a right middle lobe 
uh, uh, tumor here. Um, and we place the catheter here and we ablated, and this is the post ablation. We never breached the pleura. The comb beam CT showed that post op x ray was fine. Patient went home and came back uh, with a pneumothorax. And you see the fistula track um, on the comb beam CT when the patient came back and of this uh, ablated area. So we put a endobronchial valve in, and then um, basically uh, the patient uh, air leak stopped, and uh, we sent the patient home, removed the valve six weeks later. Um, in terms of this technology, you can think of many ways to how you can integrate this into your practice. Uh, we are seeing multifocal lung cancers. This 40-year-old lady uh, has had a right lower lobe lobectomy and a right upper lobe segmentectomy for uh, double primary, and now has developed a left upper lobe and also a left lower lobe uh, ground glass opacity that's persistent, that is uh, a little bit dense. And uh, these are certainly to be early precancerous, if not already cancerous lesions, in which we ablated both of these lesions in one session. The patient went home next day and went back to work. Um, as we heard earlier on, uh, we are also trying to use a mobile uh, a CT unit uh, to try to accomplish some of these tasks uh, in order to uh, perhaps in select cases to replace the comb beam CT uh, in hybrid room, and this will allow um, more patients to benefit from this kind of procedure. And this is the comparison of the, the two scans. Uh, this is the comb beam CT parked uh, away. This is the mobile CT unit from Siemens. Above here is the imaging from the comb beam CT, and the imaging below is from the uh, mobile unit. So they're quite comparable, maybe a few more uh, gray uh, snowflake effects on the mobile CT unit. And so this can be used um, for patients um, who do not have a pure ground glass uh, lesion because pure ground glass lesions is still a bit of a challenge for the mobile uh, CT uh, unit. Uh, two months ago, we were uh, able to acquire a uh, Oris Monarch platform, uh, first outside the US. And this is really the first case uh, that we did uh, for a biopsy of a very peripheral right lower lobe, le uh, right lower lobe lesion. And um, with the aid of a comb beam CT, uh, as you saw earlier on, um, it's very useful to show that the needle is within the, biops uh, the lesion for biopsy uh, to confirm. And of course, in the future, uh, it is possible potentially to uh, integrate this kind of robotic bronchoscopy platform uh, in delivering the ablation catheter to ablate uh, lesions um, uh, such as those you've seen earlier on. So really, um, the take home message really is that uh, in highly selected patients who uh, may not be suitable sur for surgery, has uh, poor premorbid or not suitable for conventional uh, radiotherapy, uh, this kind of transbronchial um, thermal microwave ablation uh, is a feasible and relatively safe technique for treatment uh, of these uh, malignant, small malignant uh, tumors. Uh, it is, I think, really um, has lower pleural-based complications compared with sort of percutaneous ablation approaches in the literature and uh, has comparable sort of early term uh, local control rates, um, but the medium and the long term uh, results will uh, still need to be uh, looked at in the future. So from my perspective, I think um, ablation is really here to stay. And as you've heard, um, I think as thoracic surgeons, we should really, uh, you know, uh, get our, uh, our foot in the door and um, certainly adopt this kind of technology. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ng. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for uh, some further discussion of ablation, as I suspect there will be uh, several questions and uh, other points to bring up regarding this uh, new modality for early stage lung cancer. Uh, we will move on to our final panelist, uh, Dr. Yasufuku, uh, and uh, we will uh, hopefully have time for a question and answer at the end for all of the panelists. Uh, Dr. Yasufuku. Thank you. Uh, um... Just um, waiting for the previous speaker to uh, stop sharing, I guess. Uh, so I hope you can see my um, slide. So thank you very much for asking me to be part of this panel. You've heard um, you know, great technology from the previous presenters. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of talk about you know, other uh, modalities and how we can incorporate different technologies into treatment of um, bronchoscopic therapy. So these are my disclosures. Um, so why bronchoscopic ablation? And I think you've heard 
uh, that uh, currently SBRT is standard of care for medically inoperable patients, with, especially with lung cancer. But there are a group of patients that are not candidates uh, for SBRT due to tumor location or prior treatment or perhaps existing lung disease. And you also heard that percutaneous CT guided ablation is associated with relatively high morbidity. Um, different bronchoscopic technology have become available to navigate to peripheral lung nodules. And perhaps bronchoscopic approach may be a safer and maybe cost-effective way of treatment. There is a possibility of one-stop shop diagnosis, even lens to lymph node staging and treatment at the same time. And I think you saw you know, a very nice video of um, these procedures. So these are the technical requirements for bronchoscopic ablation. You need to be able to accurately navigate to the target. You also need to confirm of, you know, access and real-time monitoring during ablation. Um, there is a need for flexibility of the ablation system, and you need to be able to protect the ablation zone. So there's various ways to navigate to the target, including ENB, um, virtual bronchoscopy, and I think more recently, robotic bronchoscopy, but also using cone beam CT guidance or even using the classical way, but with ultra thin bronchoscopy. So these different technology has become available. The other important thing, as I mentioned, is confirmation of access. And currently, if you're going after a peripheral nodule, um, I think the use of the CT scan or the cone beam CT is going to be very important. Also, um, monitoring of interoperative complications. This is an image of our GTX ORI, which uh, has a CT scan as well as a cone beam CT for various image guided transbronchial interventions. Now, you've heard about microwave ablation today, um, but these are kind of the different bronchoscopic ablative technology that may be uh, you know, possible for treatment, including RFA, microwave, cryoablation, um, thermal vapor ablation, photodynamic therapy, which typically has been used for central tumors, but applying this for peripheral tumors, also photothermal therapy, or even direct tumor injection for instance, of a cisplatin and brachytherapy. There are multiple published animal data on these technologies. Very few published data on RFA or microwave ablation or even direct tumor injection. I'm going to go through some of these. Um, the very early uh, microwave uh, bronchoscopic ablation comes from um, pig uh, studies where they were able to identify the um, ablation zone. And I think based on these studies, uh, human trials are ongoing. And I think we saw very good data um, from Calvin uh, done uh, in Hong Kong. Um, TVA, this is using the vapor technology. This was originally um, developed for um, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And there has been studies using this to actually ablate um, the lung uh, itself. Um, and this is only available in animal studies doing acute and chronic um, investigations, 84 treatments, 66 acute and 18 chronic um, ablation. It does appear that vapor is capable of creating a uniform field of necrosis, but the uh, uniformity depends on the level of energy delivered. So this was done in um, normal uh, pig lungs, but you can imagine you know, potentially using this for uh, tumors. Uh, there is toxicity related to this, as you can imagine, uh, including pneumothorax. Uh, so, uh, this is one possibility. Um, nothing has been published on the use of this in humans. 
What about bronchoscopic PDT? I see a very strong uh, potential in PDT because uh, this is not just you know applying energy and ablating. Um, it actually is a more late effect, and we we have a lot of um, evidence in centrally central type tumors. So this was a um, study that was done in three uh, dogs. These are um, client-owned pet dogs that uh, develop lung cancer. Um, Transbronchial PDT performed uh, followed by resection. Um, and in, in this study, uh, mild pneumonitis was seen in three out of three dogs, uh, dry cough, um, some photosensitivity seen in dogs, also adhesion seen in dogs. Uh, there has been a multi-center um, study using peripheral PDT. Uh, the results have not been published yet, but I think this is one of the technology that I look forward to uh, potentially using. Uh, Transbronchial RFA has been used in several centers, but Unfortunately, there are no catheters that are available, uh, for instance, in the US, North America. This early study was done from Japan um, using a, a homemade system, using different kinds of RFA probes and 10 patients. Um, the um, same group uh, used this in uh, additional 20 patients in medically inoperable lung cancer patients with total of 28 procedures with a very good local control of about 83% and no major adverse effects uh, reported. But again, this is not available in North America. There's a case report of a, a system used in China um, for inoperable disease um, in, in three patients, um, two patients with inoperable non-small cell lung cancer and one in metastatic lung tumors. Uh, they use uh, navigation bronchoscopy um, as a guidance um, showing um, PR in two patients and CR in one patient. But these are very small numbers. And again, not available in North America. You've heard uh, from Calvin about microwave ablation. I think he, is, um, he has the most experience around the world so I won't go into too details about this. Shifting gears a little bit, we were talking about peripheral tumors, and we all know that EBUS DBNA has really changed the way that we practice. And we primarily use it for diagnosis. Um, for lymph nodes, um, we have access to centrally located peribronchial tumors. The beauty of this device is that you have real-time confirmation of access, and potentially you can have real-time monitoring during therapeutics, and it's very easy to use. So why not use this for therapeutics? So we've done some animal studies using a dedicated RFA device. So this is an EBUS-guided um, uh, approach. We started with um, rabbit VX2 lung tumors, we've then used this for a uh, pick um, in survival ablation model, uh, models. And you can see um, the EBUS scope with the ablation catheter going into the tumor. Um, and in these animal studies, we've shown the ablation area. We've been able to calculate the actual ablation at zone. Uh, we also uh, determined that it's actually safe to use in survival models. And this has led us to a first in human um, a trial using this device uh, for centrally located tumors. Uh, we actually did a ablate and reject study. You can see the needle uh, device going into the tumor um, and the coil that uh, comes out of the needle um, where you can do EBUS guided RFA. For this, you don't really need, you know, any kind of other imaging. We did use the cone beam CT uh, for this trial, but you can kind of start thinking about what this can be used for. EBUS TBNI, which uh, stands for endobronchial ultrasound guided transbronchial needle injection. This, this is tumor injection. 
and uh, Matthew Kinsey has uh, a lot of experience in this. He reported the, uh, the first um, use of injection of cisplatin uh, back in uh, 2015, where he did multiple injections into tumor in patients that have recurrent lung cancer, patients that have failed radiation therapy. And in the slide, you can see the EBUS going into the tumor, um, repeated procedures, a total of three procedures. He showed good local control, as you can see on the PET scan, uh, the decrease in the FDG avidity. He then went on to report a retrospective review of 38 lesions um, and uh, 27 lesions after the 38 as showed partial or complete remission. It appears that the, the, um, the tumor density are more highly associated with response to direct uh, injection. So the current EVA scope, um, unfortunately, is too large to reach out into the periphery of the uh, lung. So this is a thin EBUS tBNA scope that we've been kind of developing together with Olympus for quite some time. It's only one millimeter smaller than the current existing EBUS scope, but um, it does give us access to tumors in the mid lung area where you can see in the red. And I think these areas are kind of the most challenging areas where other ablative technology or even SBRT may not be a good choice. So if you have more access to the mid lung area with the thin EBA scope, perhaps tumor you know, direct injection or even using these RFA devices may be another option. Um, this is a study done in uh, human lungs using this uh, thin EBA scope. Uh, you can see that we have better access to the mid lung area. Uh, we've actually been doing some studies using this EBA scope uh, for treatment of patients with uh, pulmonary embolism. Um, we haven't done it in patients, but we have shown good results in pigs. So this is the summary. Um, I think new ablative modalities uh, may become an alternative therapeutic option for SBRT, especially in medically inoperable patients. Um, the various bronchoscopic navigation modalities, um, especially the robotic platforms, may help uh, surgeons to approach nodules in a minimally invasive way. Uh, ongoing and future clinical trials, uh, and I think ablate and resect the studies will be very important to really understand the safety and effectiveness of different ablative technologies. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will start stop sharing my slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kazoo. I think uh, Doug has a question if he was going to ask. Uh, sure, sure. No, thank you both uh, for your review of these uh, ablative technologies. Uh, the, the common theme among all of these interventions is the requirement for some uh, method of uh, reaching the target within the lung. Uh, Dr. Reisenauer gave a great review of the two primary robotic platforms. Uh, a, a worthy point for discussion is I, I suspect there are several centers and surgeons out there that have legacy technologies that are trying to make the decision uh, whether to or how to justify upgrading to one of the robotic platforms. Uh, so uh, uh, my question would be, what, what would you say to those centers and surgeons as to the primary advantages that you see for, uh, for to justify the upgrade? Thanks for the question. Um, I, I think it, it goes back to what your goals are to accomplish with a robotic platform as opposed to a non-robotic platform. In both Monarch and with ION, the navigation success rate for peripheral pulmonary nodules with even as less of a distance as one millimeter away from the pleura is 98% success rate. So the ability to reach nodules anywhere in the lung is a unique advantage of these robotic technologies. And then the stability of the catheter, once you reach to those locations, um, if you're passing a needle or a forceps or a stiffer catheter through, you can see some deflection of the, of the catheter that you're using. And when you're going after something that's 
six, seven, eight millimeters, uh, even a shift of one or two millimeters makes a significant difference in terms of where you ultimately decide to biopsy or where you decide to treat. So I think just in terms of safety, stability, accuracy, particularly as the, as the world evolves from biopsy to treatment modalities, uh, I think you know, safety and accuracy have become of paramount importance. I would agree. I would agree completely. I, I think the ability to do fine movements and stability of the platform once you reach the target are the two primary advantages. The other, the other thing that we should think about, and I think is important, is almost everybody on this call, if not everybody, discussed 3D mobile imaging by means of cone beam CT or mobile 3D spin. And uh, to some degree, we've got to protect our health and our bodies from radiation exposure, as well as those of us around us. And the nice thing about these robotic technologies is that somebody is not standing there holding the scope, getting radiated throughout every single one uh, of these cases. So just being able to protect the staff in the room and the patients, it's very nice to be able to leave the catheter where it is, leave the room to do a spin and know that the catheter is not going to move uh, despite getting high quality imaging. So I think that's another important thing that's not as much discussed, but important to keep in mind. Good point. I had, I had a question for, uh, uh, Calvin and um, and also for Kazoo, and you, in terms of uh, selection, you know, one of the big things that's going to come up with ablation is how does this compare with SBRT? And uh, with SBRT, there's that no fly zone within two centimeters of the uh, tracheobronchial tree, and the risk of uh, the risk with SBRT. And you alluded to um, using this for central lesion. So I, I don't. I wonder. If, either of you could speak to the use of these technologies for central lesions and the heat sink effect and how, how good your ablations are? Um, well, we, we actually uh, don't uh, ablate the uh, middle third of the lung. So it's, re you know, the really central uh, airways in the central, around the central airways and central vessels. But we can navigate to the middle or the distal third of the lung and the parts of the lung that are abutting uh, you know, near the trachea or the SVC or something like that. Um, those areas tend to um, take the heat quite well in terms of microwave. Um, so we have ablated a number of lesions um, in those areas. One thing when you're ablating using microwave, at least uh, in my experience, in ablating a very proximal one third of the lung is that there's a lot of heat sink effect from the vessels. And also you can um, damage the, the more proximal airways and so on. Um, and the effect is not as good in destructing, destroying the tumor. So, um, So is this where you think the, some of these other technologies like direct tumor injection may come into use so, so you don't have the concerns with collapse of the airways or uh, just ineffective therapy? Uh, I mean, maybe Kazoo, you could... Yeah, uh, maybe I can comment. I, I think um, I've been really targeting the mid-lung zone because that's like a very difficult um, area for surgeons because if you have a peripheral tumor, you know, whether the patient has bad COPD or ILD, we all know we can do a very quick wedge resection, right? And, and you can do an SBRT as well. Um, but but it, with, when the tumor is in that, you know, middle, you can't do a wedge, you need to do a segment or a lobectomy, patient's not good enough for that, maybe not a good candidate for SBRT. So that that is kind of the area that I think we all struggle. And that I think is where the unmet needs are. Um, so that's why I, I feel that, you know, that that is an area with the, you know, thin EBA scope, it'll be very easy to do, easy access. Everyone pretty much does EBUS. You won't need, you know, the fancy gadgets that everyone showed. Not everyone has access to a cone beam CT or a mobile cone beam CT. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of see the benefit and I, I think, you know, whether it's an injection or different forms of ablation, I, I do see a role. I'm not saying that, you know, the peripheral nodules, um, you know, that's because that's not the only area. I think really the tumors that are in that mid lung, mid zone, you know, area um, are challenging to treat, right? We, we all think it's challenging for us. So which of those technologies do you think will be the winner in your, in your kind of early look at this? 
Um, there is no microwave ablation catheter that we can use through the EBA scope. Um, so, you know, perhaps RFA may, may be um, one way. Um, I didn't go through um, the PDT or PTT, but this is um, enhancing the treatment. I, I think that is another area that I'm looking at, photothermal therapy, using a, a combination of laser, low, low power laser and nanoparticles. So it's, it's, it's still in, you know, it's not being done in humans, but it really enhancing the ablation is going to be necessary. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. I think for the proximal lesions, um, thermal ablation may be um, difficult sometimes uh, due to the structures and non-thermal means may be possible um, as, you know, Professor Yasufuku is uh, alluding to um, drug therapy and other kinds of uh, therapy. Um, there are things like um, non-thermal ablation, like pulse electric field therapy ablation, uh, PEF, that's been investigated by a company called Galvanize um, that uh, is already starting some human trials. And that doesn't create any heat um, really um, in destroying the tumor, but rather the electric field breaks down the cell membrane and then the tumor dies um, subsequently. So those may be more suitable for more proximal lesions in the future, but that's really a long way away, you know, yeah. There's a uh, question from uh, Dr. Uh, Keyes uh, to the panelists asking about uh, using the uh, cone beam CT or the CIO spin to show uh, tool in lesion and how long did it take to achieve operator competency, competency with their cone beam technology? So, if, you know, anyone, if you guys can take that, if you use cone beam CT. I think Dr. Ng and I have both used it. Maybe we can both comment. We got the CO spin back in February. We've done probably a hundred cases with it now. We don't have a rad tech in our institution, so we have to learn how to do it. Uh, at least not in our bronchoscopy suite. So we had to train our nurses, our staff, and our residents in how to do it. And within five cases, we had kind of figured out the important features. So I think if you're a regular cone beam user, it's a very, very easy integration. But even if you're not, and you're just a standard 2D uh, fluoroscopy user, the in-service that they provide is excellent. And as I've said before, in our personal experience, our diagnostic yield, at least for biopsies, went from 86 to 88% to 95% in our most recent series. So it's a really good, less expensive alternative to a fixed cone beam CT. Uh, my experience is uh, very small compared with uh, Janani's. Uh, we only done about uh, 10, 15 cases uh, as a, like a clinical trial. Um, we were using cone beam CT in the hybrid theater beforehand. So it really just took one or two cases to get familiar with the, the machine, uh, the mobile CT. Um, and I, I mean, it works fine, I think. Um, but the feedback I think I gave in the lecture was also, if you have a pure ground glass opacity, uh, very faint ground glass opacity that's relatively small, uh, it can be difficult to localize because of some sort of snowflaking effect it, it does have compared with Combeam CT. Um, and it doesn't have the measurement tools that are available uh, to do ablation uh, right now, but that's something that can be developed, I guess, quite quickly if that's something that's going to be, you know, a hot area of development. Quick question for uh, Dr. Wexler. Um, uh, when you're planning, say, a segmentectomy uh, for a, a GGO type of lesion, which is going to be difficult to find, uh, do you think that uh, using uh, the uh, ion will and, and marking will eliminate the need for uh, segmentectomy uh, scans or segmentation CT scans, or do you think you still need those better scans when you're trying to figure out, you know, which segment to chase after exactly? Well, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think there, there are several issues here. I mean, one, uh, uh, the, the, the 3D planning would, would preoperatively is always helpful because you have vessels, you have bronchus, you have veins. So it, it helps you perform the segmentectomy. However, I, I'll give you a very recent example. We, we did a, a, a segmentectomy for a, a GGO that was enlarging and it was, you know, a lingolectomy which I thought was completely straightforward, but I couldn't find the lesion. The pathologist couldn't find the lesion, but we didn't have any other place for the lesion to be. And I kept saying, gee, I should have marked it because then I would be sure. 
turn out that it was a an AV malformation that um, we because we didn't do a CT with contrast we didn't realize it but um, you know if I had marked it I would have known for sure and not lose a couple of nights sleep until the pathologist finished cutting the specimen and detecting it and it, and then for Dr Eisenhower any uh, nodules that you think are difficult to get to that you, you, uh, you know, what, what are the nodules that you just know that you're not going to have a chance to get with, uh, with, uh, with the robot? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, it's interesting. Sometimes cases will still kind of surprise you a little bit. Um, I, I would say, um, it has less to do with the reach and the navigation. And a lot of times it just has to do with getting the appropriate amount of sample in your tool to be able to give to the pathologist so that they can make the call. Um, you know, so, so, so some, you know, various type of immunoproliferative type of disorders where you're trying to differentiate between the different types of lymphoma um, can sometimes be a little bit trickier. Um, making that distinction between a truly, um, you know, AIS situation versus an invasive adenocarcinoma can be tricky if you don't provide enough tissue. So I think it's, it's less about not being able to get it with the robot and, and more about making sure that you've got a good relationship with your cytopathologist and that you're giving them enough tissue so that they can analyze it appropriately. Um, I, I think size, bronchocyne, all of those things that were traditionally roadblocks for, for a conventional uh, manual bronchoscopy have somewhat gone away with the robot, which is great. Uh, it looks like uh, we're past uh, the hour. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, and the panelists and uh, also thank the STS and Michelle and Meredith uh, and uh, I wish everyone a good evening. And, uh, you know, please email the speakers if you have any questions and, and thank you very much. Thank you to our moderators and panelists for your participation and insight. Join us next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar, a discussion with STS and AETS leaders on the science behind three main areas of concern that led to not endorsing new revascularization guidelines. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll join a variety of discounts, benefits, and opportunities to help you grow professionally. Learn more at scs.org membership. Subscribe today to the STS Cardiothoracic Surgery eBook. Online or mobile, it is the most convenient and authoritative resource for CT surgical information in the world. Learn more at sts.org ebook. Thank you and have a good night.